nice introduction, and thank you, uh, everybody, for um, coming out. I just want to make sure I can be heard in the back of the room. Good? Yes. Everyone? Okay. All right, so the book is uh, Milwaukee Mayhem. It's uh, kind of a, you know, where it's a collection of short uh, nonfiction stories from Milwaukee's past, sort of the, uh, uh, you know, tending more toward the, uh, the strange and macabre. But just to kick things off, I'm going to read... Uh, Start off by reading one of the stories uh, from the book. This is a story from April 1855, and it is called Not John Dwight. Some fishermen happened upon a terrible sight while working near the mouth of the Milwaukee River. Surfacing after an estimated three months in the water was a badly mutilated male corpse. His hands hacked off, his legs hacked off, his hands bound tight, and throat cut. The body had been tied up in a cotton bag and then stuffed into a coffee sack and cinched about the neck with a sailor's knot bound so skillfully that no landsman could have dreamed of making it. The head of the victim displayed a horrific axe wound that had split open the skull. It was impossible to determine by which trauma the man had died. Horrific discoveries of this type were, uh, had become a disturbingly regular occurrence on Milwaukee's waterways. This was the third badly mangled body to be found in recent months. The river and lake, wrote the Milwaukee Sentinel, are almost daily giving up the mangled bodies of men who have been deprived of life by folly violence. The black-haired victim was laid out on the docks near the lakefront checkered warehouse so the locals might be able to identify him. A mate on the vessel Old Bull recognized the body as that of John Dwyer, a sailor who had worked in Milwaukee the previous winter. Others soon concurred, pointing to a scar on the battered face of the man to match one worn by Dwyer. No one was found who could remember seeing Dwyer since Christmas. No sane man, the Sentinel wrote, could have doubted that the remains were those of John Dwyer. In tracking down former acquaintances of Dwyer to testify as to the body's identity, the police heard of a man named Harris who was said to have worked with Dwyer. They found Harris laboring at a, lake set, at a lakefront dock and, upon asking him about Dwyer, discovered that the supposedly dead man was still very much alive. He was working at the same dock within miles where the body had been found. The police found Dwyer ready to, uh, the police found Dwyer to be ready to make an oath that the torso in the river, which would remain unidentified, was not his. So that's, uh, a sample of what I've got here. And these are, um, Stories that um, I just started collecting while I was doing other, researching other topics in local history through the, uh, the, the Milwaukee Sentinel and Journal uh, primarily. Uh, just these odd stories, these little, you know, one or two day events that um, you're really captured by attention, but I didn't have any, you know, real larger idea for them. I just thought they were kind of interesting. So I just, you know, put a pin in all these until I, I realized that if I put together enough of these, they might uh, weave together kind of a strange narrative of Milwaukee's uh, founding uh, years of early years. And as I was doing this, I developed this idea as these uh, stories and characters kind of being the, the orphans of history, uh, things that were um, too weird or too interesting to ignore, but, you know, not really part of any large, uh, you know, conventional narrative arc of the city's history. But uh, I also felt this idea that there was something in the birth of a major city that, that led to this. Um, you know, the, the, the progress westward uh, of America kind of uh, brought about these odd characters, a lot of cases, men drew into these places that really, um, you know, had no real connection to the area, but were there to, to make money and it, it, it attracted a lot of less than reputable characters and just uh, you know, led to a lot of, of strange things that don't really, you know, fit the more traditional narrative of the city's history, but are, are still a part of the story. Um, so as I, was, as I was putting this together, I um, ended up dividing the stories into four different sections. Uh, murder, vice, disasters, and secrets. Uh, the John Dwyer story, although it is a bit of a, a mystery or a secret as to who the person actually was, is included in the, the murder chapter. And, um, now, John Dwyer himself is a terribly interesting character. He just happened to be a sailor who hadn't been murdered. Um, but the, the next story I'm going to tell is uh, uh, covers one of my, the more uh, interesting people that I encountered while I was doing this. Um, 
a man named William Mobius. So this next story is, is his tale. This is from August of 1884, and it is called In a Violinist's Hands. Professor William Mobius, well-known classical violinist and music instructor, stumbled out of a Grand Avenue gambling parlor, a loaded British bulldog revolver in his pocket, and death on his mind. It was just past 2 p.m. on a Sunday. As a child, Mobius had been a musical prodigy, sent to the conservatory at Dresden at age nine, and touring Prussia by age 14. He had played in orchestras in France, Spain, and Italy. After immigrating to America, he played New York City, and led his own orchestra in Louisville before returning to tour the grand concert halls of Europe. In 1879, he brought his wife and eight children to Milwaukee. There, he taught music and performed at the city Bach Orchestra, but he also took to gambling. A string of heavy losses had forced him into a state of horrid dejection. Nearing the foot of the Grand Avenue Bridge, he pulled the gun from his pocket and fired a single round toward the dirt. The professor was not familiar with firearms. He had purchased the weapon and a box of ammunition only an hour earlier from a West Water Street gun shop. The weapon was so foreign to him that he returned to the shop a few minutes later and asked the clerk if he'd be so kind as to load it. From there, he hastened to Grand Avenue and played his last $10. He lost. The volley into the ground is a practice shot. Satisfied he could operate the piece, he placed it to his chest and squeezed off four shots. The gunfire, gunfire drew the attention of the midday downtown traffic. A crowd had already begun to form around Mobius when some nearby police detectives placed the still breathing, greatly stunned, and entirely unharmed professor under arrest. <laughs> the gun Mobius had placed to his heart with the intention of ending his life had been filled with flags. The clerk who had sold Mobius the pistol was so disturbed by the professor's peculiar behavior in his shop that he pocketed the bullets Mobius had purchased and loaded the gun with harmless imitation ammunition. <laughs> At the station, he said he appreciated uh, Mobius said he appreciated the clerk's deception and that he was glad to be alive. He also expressed concern over a small bundle of letters he had dropped into a mailbox just before his failed suicide. Hello. <laughs> they were addressed to various family members and friends, explaining his plight and detailing his intention of self-murder. Before his wife collected him at the station, he was asked if there was anything that could be done to prevent the letters from being delivered. He was told there was nothing. It was expected that the letters would be received early the next week. Uh, so that's the story of William Mobius, and um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, I was, I was getting these stories from the newspapers, I was just paging through, looking up other things, and uh, you really get, um, you know, when the daily newspaper still really existed, uh, you really got um, a sense of of the times and uh, of you know what people what things people were were talking about, um, what they were concerned about, what the panics of the the day were, and you know one of the things that really uh, stuck with me was that um, it's a lot of the same things people talk about, are concerned about, are panicked about. Um, you know today, well, the uh, saying of uh, you know sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That was still, you know, very much around, and uh, in you know, the eighteen sixties, nineteen teens, however, how far back you want to go. Um, so well, the you know particulars might have changed. There was, you know, it's, the, the stories that came up are uh, you know not so unfamiliar, wouldn't be so unfamiliar uh, today. And uh, one of the, you know, one of the um, moral panics of the, the later eighteen hundreds uh, was. Uh, drug use, particularly opium, so opioid problems. Um, so this is a little sample of that. Uh, this one is this one is from the the uh, the vice chapter, which covers a lot of those uh, you know moral panics and that kind of thing. Uh, so this is from August 1881. This is called Blackjack. A story was being circulated in the city of a well-to-do local farmer whose wife had become hopelessly addicted to opium. Unable to stop her from using the drug, the farmer locked her in a small room in their house, hoping that time could cure her insatiable habit. After several days of confinement, the farmer finally allowed the poor woman to leave the room. She snuck away at the soonest chance and headed for the city, where she broke into several general stores, stealing items and reselling them to second-hand stores before taking her cash to the nearest opium den. She was found some time later and was, according to the Milwaukee Sentinel, 
stupefied by opium and in blissful ignorance of her surroundings. Milwaukee's troubles with opium dated back to pioneer times, when its most regular users were the elderly. By 1880, when the Sentinel sent a reporter to investigate use of the drug in the city, they reported that most of the users had already died off. But rumors abound of prominent wealthy citizens partaking of the drug. Opium use was uh, most commonly associated with the Chinese, but the reporter found that use among that race in the city was limited. Overall, women were three times more likely to use opium than men, and its use was most com uh, most concentrated in the pitiful class of abandoned women. I'll do this to indicate when I'm quoting the newspaper, because this isn't necessarily language or terminology. Uh, few users smoked the stuff the reporter learned, with men more likely to eat it, and women preferring to dilute it in hot water and sip it as they would tea. Some turned to opium to ease physical pain or soothe mental troubles, while others used it for its stimulating and happy effect. A uh, similar inquest the following year found the opium trade in the city to be centered in the Badlands of the Fourth Ward, which would be uh, downtown Milwaukee, where the basketball arena is. That area was uh, yeah, up until the 1930s or 40s, really, where a lot of the vice trade went on in the city. Um, and it was known as the Badlands. A sentinel man visited one such den in the basement of a bakery and candy shop on 3rd Street. The ring chain laundry provided a front for the den, which was run by a dope boss named only a Sam who had arrived in the city from New Orleans four months earlier. The foreboding and noisome quarters of the place were filthy and hot, strewn with trash and dirty clothes. A room off the main area was provided by those who wished to smoke their dose, which sold at wholesale values for between $8 and $10 per pound. Unlike assertions the paper had made the year before, it was now reported that the trade was growing. The city health department was investigating several low-end pharmacies that sold vast amounts of opium and an increasing volume of morphine. The evil, the Sentinel wrote, is assuming vast and terrible proportions. So, um, as common uh, as you know, drug use was worries about drug use. Uh, were common in this area, so were uh, concerns about sexuality, especially among uh, children. That's kind of, or younger people, really. Uh, that's kind of a constant through a lot of, uh, it's certainly Milwaukee's history, and probably human history as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the stories in that vary, uh, vary from, you know, being quite serious and grim and stuff that I, you know, didn't really want to include in this book. And then uh, the more... <coughs> Looking back, uh, the, looking back on them today, seem, uh, some stories that seem more uh, whimsical and uh, silly, and this is one that will tend more towards the, um, the, the, the silly today, I guess. Um, so this is from January 1922, jumping ahead a couple of decades. Uh, one of the panics that wasn't quite so threatening. This is called With Bells On. The most recent fashion accessory of the Milwaukee flapper was causing concern among school officials. <coughs> Flappers, a teenage army of pretty little girls with bob hair, short skirts, and rouged faces, per the Milwaukee Journal, were known for their slinky sex appeal and alluring perfumes. But this new trend was drawing attention from more than just the eyes and the nose. <coughs> the most chic of the flapper set was now adorning her outfit with small, jingling bells whose Tinkle accommodates for promenade. By the time these jingling flappers were set loose on summer vacation, the journal was already declaring that the year of 1922 would go down as that of the great flapper controversy. At 14, they looked like grown women did before the war. At 17, they can pass for 24, the paper wrote. If you're a high school boy, you say they have snap and make keen dates and are proud to walk down the street with one of them hanging to your arm. Of course, it was not high school boys who were worrying so loudly about these girls and their snap. The mobility and independence of the flappers seemed to some a fast road found to ruin. The Milwaukee flappers found their idols at the movies and dressed to mimic their favorite female stars. They went with boys who drove fast cars, went to dance halls and roadhouses, and spent the money of their companions, or even their own as many worked, on hot drinks on cold drinks, not hot jazz. The journal talked to one young girl who had just the night before been up until 3 a.m. in a country roadhouse. 
The reporter asked her if there was any adult supervision to her night. What is the want of a chaperone, the flapper spat. We knew the boys, and anyway, a girl can take care of herself. The reporter found another girl who was also familiar with the back roads. Do I let boys take liberties with me? Not so you can notice, she told me. <laughs> if I like a boy pretty well, I let him kiss me if he wants to, and of course he always wants to. If I don't like him, nothing do. Seeing that the journal man was taken aback by her attitude toward what was once a fairly verboten subject, she continued, why not? If you like boys, why not let them know? Why not have a good time as you go along? There'll be trouble enough later on. Any movie will show you that. <laughs> Despite the somewhat shocking behavior the journal man uncovered, he was less alarmed by the flapper than others. So why not let the flappers flap if they want to, he asked his readers. Their momentary eccentricities probably are far more harmless than we choose to believe. As for the flappers jingling dresses, school officials said they would probably move to ban bells from acceptable student clothing. The accompaniment, it was said, had a tendency to distract the boys' attention from more serious matters. Uh, so there's actually quite a few, uh, a few stories in the book that are kind of in that same vein. Um, there was one, uh, I don't think the movement was very widespread, but uh, there's actually a brief a uh, moment in the 20s where there was a movement to ban kissing in Milwaukee on the grounds that it uh, was well, just more than just Milwaukee, this is a nationwide, a minor thing, but a nationwide thing, on the, just on the grounds that it, it spread disease. Uh, which was a story I used to tell after you know, the past couple of years. And it's, uh, it, it just seems less uh, out there, really, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, so that was one of them. Um, there was also <coughs> the uh, the first uh, boat the Milwaukee Police Department purchased to patrol the Milwaukee River was uh, used on the upper part of the, of the river, where uh, at one time there were a lot of uh, uh, you know resorts. There was even a small amusement park along the river up there. So there's a lot of accessible space along the waterway, and it became a spot. Uh, again, in the 20s, where young people, teenagers, would, would gather and have parties and you know, do what teenagers do when they gather and have parties in, in the dark. And um, also, I know, there's a lot of canoeing on the river, um, canoodling in canoes, if you will, on that part of the river. And they, uh, the, the police department literally called the boat the Killjoy. <laughs> uh, and they had a number of I think they, they ran Killjoys up in I think into the 1950s so the you know, Killjoy and the Killjoy 2 and I'm not sure if that was I don't think that had it was painted on the side or anything but that's not what they referred to it um, so I mentioned earlier getting a lot of this uh, from the newspapers um, you know a lot of these stories it's you know the way the, uh, how I'm interested and why I'm interested in them is just in how it was, how the stories were reported, not necessarily so much the stuff that happened, but how people, uh, how the papers wrote about it, how people would have, um, you know, absorbed that information, which I, I think would have uh, guided how they would have talked about it amongst themselves. Um, and the time span of the book, uh, Milwaukee's first century, so 1840s into the 1940s. Uh, the bulk of the, the stories in the book are probably more clustered around the turn of the century. Um, and that has to do, you know, with the source material as well. Um, you know, even in the few stories I've read so far, I pull a lot of quotes out of the newspapers just because there was such a, uh, a very uh, florid writing style of the time. Uh, for a lot of the period this book covers, uh, journalism was considered kind of a, a low profession. Uh, they had a very, uh, you know, the, the life of a reporter was kind of a, you know, living, yeah, a little bit on the fringes. And the uh, the writing style, I think, kind of reflects that. There's a lot of, uh, you know, dark gallows humor in these stories. Uh, for example, the one about you know, the body that they pulled out of the river, that the, um, you know, whoever wrote that story up. Uh, put that joke in there about John Dwyer, you know, he's going to go go down to the courthouse and take an oath. It was not his headless torso that was found in the river. Um, and they, they, the stories are, are very gossipy in a way. That is uh, certainly not acceptable today in any you know, reputable kind of journalism. Um, 
for example, there's a, a story <laughs> in the book. I won't. I'm not going to read it, but uh, tonight. But uh, it's about a, a spree of um, uh, suicides in I believe it's the 1890s. And you know, t- uh, today you probably won't even see much reporting of somebody um, dies by suicide, and you know, some even in a some uh, public setting that they just don't report that. But um, you know, then they kind of investigated these incidents. There was one, uh, at least one story, or uh, one instance of somebody taking their own life where the, uh, the newspaper published um, passages from the, the note that the person had left. They would go and talk to people uh, to try to figure out why this happened. You know, was this a, a lovelorn person? They have money troubles? Um, home addresses were almost always published in the newspaper as well. This is something that lasted up into the 19. 19- uh, 70s, really. But if um, you know, for whatever reason, if they printed your name, you, your home address would be next to it in the newspaper. Um, which actually, this wow, this book came out 2015, so quite a while ago already. But uh, one of the you know, the year after it came out, I did a lot of library events like this, and um, after the, my talk, somebody mentioned that um, they said, "Oh, well, my." My mother witnessed a kind of a famous crime in Milwaukee uh, in the 50s, and it was actually turned out to be one that I, I've written about in the book, where um, a, a young man shot his ex-girlfriend at a, at a drugstore. She was sitting, you know, she was sharing soda with her friend, uh, and then shot himself. Uh, she, she died. He didn't, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, so he had a. This gentleman had a scrapbook of the, the clippings that you know talked about you know, the crime, and then he went on trial. And his, his uh, mother was one of the, uh, uh, the witnesses at the, at the trial, and so he's paging through this, and he's telling me all about it. And he, there's a picture, the newspapers were huge, then, so it's this big picture of his mother when she was 17 and 18 uh, on the stand testifying, and he pointed to it. And he's like, "Oh, this is the picture that you know got my parents together." I mean, what do you mean? That's how your parents got together. And he said, oh, well, my, my father saw her picture in the newspaper and thought she was good looking, so he went to her house and asked her out on a date. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was like, oh, yeah, they, the lockers were next to each other. That's how they met. Like, he didn't even, he wasn't even going to tell me that part of the story. But, so there was this, this very, you know, uh, people were very close to what had you know, there was a, there wasn't much distance between a lot of these stories and the, the public in general. Um, another one of the, uh, you know, the themes that run through this is whenever there's a big disaster, fire or shipwreck or whatever, uh, right after it happens, there's these enormous crowds of people who come down to, to see this. I mean, this was, you know, the, part of the entertainment of the, the era. So, uh, you know, you hear the, the, uh, the phrase desensitized to violence. Uh, I've been hearing that for the last couple of decades. For, you know, usually in relation to movies or video games or something, but you know, reading these newspapers, you realize just how uh, close all this stuff was to everyday life. Um, you know, there was, uh, I get the feeling that this, you know, you were more of an active observer uh, when a lot of these things happened, and in the way that, you know, the way it's reported, too. Um, you're, you're very close. There's not a lot of distance. There's not a lot of stuff that they, they don't talk about. So, um, you know, putting these together, I wanted to get kind of a, you know, get a feel for how people pro- would have, might have processed these things, how they would have taken them in, uh, how this would have been a part of everyday life. Uh, and this next, I'm going to read, the next one I'm going to read is only half of a story, but it, uh, yeah. So it kind of, it kind of gets to that idea of, of how, you know, a little distance there was uh, between, you know, the one side of things and the other side of things uh, in this era. There was no uh, police tape in those days, uh, both literally and, and figuratively. Um, a lot of, you know, the, the story in the beginning when they, uh, they found the body in the river, then they laid him out for people to see. Excuse me, that's 
it's kind of gruesome to think of now, but that's how they needed to do it. That's the only means they had of identifying a body back then. And also, um, up into the, the 1930s, it was also commonplace for uh, the police, if someone had died in the commission of a crime, to basically put that the body on display for the public to come look at. Uh, there was um, uh, something I'd, I'd written about for the Wisconsin uh, Magazine of History, uh, where in it was 1935, there was this uh, young malcontent who had stolen a bunch of dynamite from a work site and was placing bombs by, by banks and uh, uh, the police, uh, one of the police stations. And for a week, Milwaukee was kind of sort of on edge because there was this uh, mysterious bomber who was blowing things up. And then uh, him and his, his accomplice ended up, uh, they were trying to build a very large bomb that went off as they were building it. And they were both killed. And uh, so what was left of their bodies was put on display. Oh. And like 10,000 people came just to walk past and, and see these two. You know, I think one was 21, the other was like 17. Um, so the, you know, this uh, interest people have in the macabre, you know, whether it's true crime books or podcasts or Netflix or, or whatever, that, that's nothing new, but the, um, yeah, I guess, you know, the podcasts at the time or whatever was actually going to, to look at parts of bodies and, and scenes where houses had burned down and, um, and things like that. So this is, this story kind of gets to that. Um, I'm only going to read the second half here, but the, um, this is uh, the summer of 1898. This is called The Woman at the Breakwater. And the uh, setup to this is uh, a, uh, a body of a woman has been found on the beach. Um, they have no way of identifying the body, so it gets to the newspapers, and then these uh, kids come forward, these two boys who worked at a, a boat stand on the, the lakefront. Uh, they, uh, they tell the police about a month earlier, a man and a woman, who vaguely describes the, or matches the body that was found on the lake, uh, he rented a boat, they both went out about an hour later, he came back alone, said that the woman got scared, so she he left her off at um, the beach a little east of where they were. Two kids can't think much of it. Then once his body washes up, they come forward, they put this together, they figure that this uh, man took this woman out on the lake and murdered her and left the body. Um, and once, you know, a body that's been in the water that long, uh, once you pull it out, it pretty much just falls apart. So they don't really have even much of a body. To... But if the police had a general idea as to how the crime was committed, they still had no clue as to the identities of those involved. Hundreds of Milwaukeeans were drawn to the display of the garments, including curious ones who were, in the words of the Milwaukee Sentinel, impelled by a morbid interest in gruesome things and inspected the discolored garments with an evident pleasure. So they've, they've got the, the underclothes that the, uh, the pores are on the bottom. Uh, and again, they kind of put these on display for people to come back and pass them. Scores of tips revealed dozens of women, either Milwaukee residents or visitors, who could not be located by loved ones. One woman feared the departed to be her daughter, whom she had not heard from in some time and was quite unhappily married to a man who had threatened on several occasions to kill her. Another tip told of a woman who had taken up with a married man. When the situation turned sour, the man told a friend of the woman that he had given her some money and left town. The missing woman's friend suspected he was not telling the truth. One man told police his wife had run off of him and was last known to be living in Milwaukee. He was asked for, he asked for, and was given a piece of the lace from the underclothes found on the body. He refused to give his name, but promised to return the next day with information. More information. And he was, of course, never seen again. A Chicago man made the trip north and said the clothes looked very similar to those owned by his wife, who had walked out on him some time ago. Examining the teeth from the corpse, however, he became convinced that the body was not that of his wife. He was fairly unmoved during the process, telling police he was merely curious as to the identity of the body and did not care one whit if his wife was alive or dead. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the case's publicity, no positive identification of the body was ever made. 
Three days after the woman at the breakwater was recovered, she was buried in a potter's field at the county poor farm along the south bank of the Milwaukee River to be forever eulogized as a name. Uh, so that's, that's from the, the secrets chapter. That's where I, I ended up putting a lot of the more mysterious uh, stories. I did the, uh, I was at the Milwaukee Paranormal Conference over the weekend at El Verno Mountain. And uh, I was on a panel with some other uh, local writers and um, I felt a little out of place because my, <coughs> just me personally, I'm, I'm fairly skeptical when it comes to that kind of stuff. Uh, there are, uh, sometimes people ask me if there's you know, ghost stories or things in the book, and there are a couple, uh, you know, more supernatural type things. But again, you know, and I'm looking at that in this book, it's from more of the point of view of, uh, you know, how they wrote about it, how people would have talked about it at the time. So there's, you know, there, there's some stuff, in, you know, more uh, bordering on the paranormal, but a lot of the secrets are, just stories that don't have ends. Another, um, yeah, it might, might be a drawback. It might be, I guess, depending on the story. Uh, well, with the, the you know sticking uh, with the, the newspaper uh, reporting, uh, is that you know when they got bored with something, uh, when people didn't really want to read about it anymore, the, the paper stopped writing about it, whether the story had come to a conclusion or not. Um, a lot of these things, you know, if it's a, a missing person or, uh, you know, somebody they think might have been kidnapped or some unsolved murder, uh, after a while, like, like how people deal with things today, they just sort of forget about it, move on, and um, which leaves a lot of these stories kind of open-ended. Um, the, uh, the scrapbook story I mentioned earlier, that was actually uh, an example of you know, me finding out uh, a little more about one of these stories even after the book was done because the, uh, so the, the, the young man who shot and killed the young woman, uh, after doing that, he put the gun to his own head and pulled the trigger, but it, it just, it went, passed through his brain in such a way that he didn't actually die. He ended up uh, blinded, but uh, still alive and eventually, you know, it, Aside from the loss of his vision, didn't really have any uh, ill effects from this. Um, so I, you know, when I was researching the story, I saw that he was, uh, you know, he obviously went on trial because the, the, the woman testified there, but he was convicted and sent to jail. And then I just assumed that was the end. But the, uh, the fellow with the scrapbook, he told me that um, after five or six years in prison, he ended up being pardoned because his father was a very prominent contractor and was very good friends with the, the governor of Wisconsin at that time. Uh, so he ended up getting out. And this is not something I had any idea of. So a lot of these uh, stories, and you know, when you're researching these things, it's easy to fall down a rabbit hole and just want to spend you know, months trying to dig into something. And with the, uh, yeah, the time I had to write the book and having to put so many stories in it that wasn't really a uh, a luxury I had, but I kind of liked how it ended up in just being, you know, these very uh, brief glimpses into these things that were, uh, these stories that were for a brief period very prominent uh, in the city. And as I said, a lot of these uh, stories don't have endings. And I'm sure if I have sat down and, and spent all the time I wanted to looking into them, um, you know, I, I might never find out what happens with some of these. But of all the stories, in the book, <clears throat> the one I always say that if I had some uh, crystal ball and could magically find out what had become of anybody in here, it would be the, uh, the subject of this next story. This is going to be the, uh, the last one, uh, the last story I'll read. So this one, uh, also from 1898, uh, this is called The Runaways. <clears throat> On a street corner near the Wells Street train depot in Chicago, two Milwaukee children approached a police officer. Take us to our Uncle Adam, John Matthews, age 10, told the cop. At his side was his eight-year-old sister, Louisa. When the, officers told the kid, when the officer told the kids he had no idea who Uncle Adam was, John offered an alternative. Well, take us to our Aunt Polly. The pair ended up at the police station. When they asked uh, how they had been 
how they had come to be so far from home, John told the police that they had been kidnapped. According to the boy, the police had, approached, had been approached at Milwaukee's Chicago and Northwestern Railroad Depot, the big house by the lake, as he put it, by a well-dressed woman who asked them if they would like to take a train ride. They said they would, and she purchased three tickets, loaded them aboard a southbound train, and sat with them all the way to Chicago. Upon arriving in the city, she told them to wait at the depot, left, and never returned. The police contacted the children's frantic parents, who had not seen them since sending them off to Sunday school that morning. <laughs> Their father, William Matthews, rushed down to Chicago to retrieve the children and sat with them as they recounted their fantastic story to a Milwaukee police detective. The children went on and on about the Chinamen and all sorts of funny people they had seen in Chicago and the cross woman who they had encountered at the Chicago police station who was saying horrid things because she did not like the bread they gave her to. Yeah. But their description of the kidnapping was evidently lacking, and both the police and the children's parents agreed that the pair had simply run away. Evidently, John had been punished by his mother for lying the day before and had determined to skip town. <laughs> police sent the kids home with their parents, who punished both for their flight to the south, but once again, little John Matthews felt this penalty was undue. The very next day, he and Louisa once again walked to the lakefront depot, boarded a train, and despite declarations that they did not like the city, disembarked in Chicago, where they once again claimed to have been kidnapped and were held at the police station to await their father. <laughs> Mr. Matthews had no idea how the children had managed to make the trip twice without paying and without drawing the suspicion of any adults for them. He told the newspapers that his son was likely next bound for an industrial school. <laughs> <laughs> so out of everybody, I always wondered what became of John Matthews, and for anybody here who's done any uh, research or certainly genealogy, um, you know, the name John Matthews does <laughs> give you a lot to go on, uh, especially back in this era, but I always, always wonder if that uh, spark of ingenuity, which direction that led him in, because you can really go uh, a lot of different, very, a lot of very different ways with that. What year was uh, that? Uh, 1898. So I wonder how Dad got down to the train, down to Chicago. I probably took a train, too. Um, but, um, yeah. in a, you know, I'll have a, some time for questions here at the end, but, um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of the research I did on this was at the, uh, the downtown, li the library of downtown Milwaukee, because they've got a wonderful uh, resource there. It's these set of giant, uh, a lot of card catalog cards, um, cabinets, and every issue of the Milwaukee Sentinel from sort of eighteen thirty-seven to nineteen or eighteen ninety. So the, that entire period, every article in the Sentinel is indexed uh, and transcribed. It, uh, index headings transcribed onto these cards. So if you um, you know, pull out a drawer for kidnapping. Go down to kidnapping. Under that, there's a card for each article on kidnapping that appeared in the paper at that time. So, you know, it's April 5th, 1873, column four, and the title of the column, which made it, I mean, that couldn't have been done without, uh, without that resource. But um, kidnapping was kind of the, the one area of the book, because there's a lot of articles on kidnapping, but almost none of them turn out to be an actual. Uh, Kidnapping, you know, it's uh, a kid goes missing and they think it might be a kidnapping or somebody lies about being kidnapped because they got into something they shouldn't be or, you know, John Matthews here just wanting to blow town. Um, but just in my, you know, the mindset I was in, I was writing this book, was uh, there was one story about a kidnapping that was, I was found really interesting and Kept, you know, I kept having to, to dig at it to find more stuff about this, this, you know, this um, young girl who'd gone missing, and then, um, you know, I finally found an article a couple weeks after all this started that, uh, you know, said it was just, it was just some mix-up about, you know, she went to stay with an aunt or something and, and didn't tell anybody, so it was, you know, she was safe, she'd never been in danger. My reaction to that was, oh man, I wish, <laughs> <laughs> I wish something horrible had happened. Um, so the kidnapping stories are, and that might be, well, there are no real ones that I was able to, to find, but uh, kind of speaks to my, my house, 
weird little mindset got me to put all this <laughs> together. Um, so yeah, that's another one I'd, I'd like to end with that because it's a little little uplift on the uh, the proceedings here. So if anybody uh, has any questions or anything, we can have time for for that or okay. If your parents met because of a <laughs> picture in the newspaper with one of those things. And the weirdest thing about that, the scrapbook story was, um, it was early enough after this came out that the, the, uh, this was published in the Wisconsin Historical Society Press, so one of their um, representatives was, was there as well. And uh, it turned out that her parents had also met in some, I forget exactly the details, but like her mother was working at a, the college she was at, she was in a science lab late at night and was, um, uh, hit by a stray bullet that came through a window and then was on the news and her father was like, hey, she's cute. <laughs> and that's how they met. Um, which, uh, it's, yeah, the, it's that idea of knocking on someone's door. And, I'd like to ask your daughter because I saw her testify. <laughs> uh, if anybody has questions. Did anyone ask questions? Let me know when I'm right. Can I bring this over? Were, were, most, were most of those papers in German? Written in German? Because I heard that all of the newspapers were in German. Um, well, they, the, so there was, there's always, as long as you know, there was a European settlement at Milwaukee, or since the, the village was founded, there was at least one English language paper. The uh, majority of newspaper circulation up into the 1890s, I think, was German language. Um, so that's, I mean, yeah, that's a limitation of this because I don't speak German or read it. So um, this is how English reading and speaking people were, were absorbing these things, I guess, is a better way of, of putting that. So yeah, I can get into any of those. So the Journal Sentinel was in English? Correct, yeah. yeah. The, um, the Germanian was the... Uh, the, the big German language paper. But yeah, the, the majority of newspapers sold in Milwaukee for a long time were over German language. Yeah. 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 Can you speak a little bit about, it seemed to me there were a lot of um, examples of fires and tragedies tied to the fires, especially when was it in a hotel? Was it a, was it a firefighter? A yeah, yeah. Um, the building and so, <clears throat> That's actually, I don't have any copies of that with me, but my, uh, my, it's my most recent book uh, was on the New Hall House Fire, which is, um, there's a, a story in uh, the, the Mayhem book about the New Hall House Fire, but that was uh, 1883, uh, downtown Milwaukee. Uh, if you're familiar with it, it's where the Hilton Garden Inn is today, or it's right across the street from the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce building. Uh, it was at one time one of the most luxurious hotels outside of New York uh, burned down in the middle of the night in January uh, 1883. Uh, a fire started at the base of the elevator shaft and at that time they had, uh, they were uh, open capped elevators. So there was a little roof over the top, but it was, it was open to deal with the, the air displaced of the elevator roof. Um, so being warm in the hotel, being cold outside, there was a, a rush of air going up, a fire started, still undetermined at the bottom of the elevator, and that basically acted as a, a flue to uh, engulf the entire building pretty quickly. Uh, 75 people died in that fire, which is uh, one of the, still remains one of the deadliest hotel fires uh, of all time. But yeah, fires were a constant uh, threat in those uh, in that era, um, and the, you know, I mentioned that I had kind of a limited time to work with each topic as I was doing uh, this book, and as I you know, once I decided to do a whole book about the New Hall House, I found that a lot of the stuff, the more commonly accepted versions of the story, actually, uh, a lot of that was more myth than, than fact. Um, and one of the things that always gets me about that is that there was this idea that after that fire, the city made all these changes to the fire codes, so something like this would never happen again. Um, and in reality, they changed almost nothing. Um, fires, the, uh, 
the danger of it was again something that was omnipresent, but very little, it was very little done about. It really wasn't until the Triangle of Sure Waste Fire in New York, and I think 1917, that there was actually a serious effort to um, reform uh, fire safety laws. But uh, yeah, that was one of the, <laughs> that was the worst um, in terms of loss of life fire in Milwaukee history. I just uh, wanted to say you, you talked about the morbid curiosity of people in that time, but anybody following social media knows that that morbid curiosity has never gone away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, it, people, and a lot of other things that are mentioned in the book, they tend to ascribe these problems to you know, modern times or you know, kids these days, but people have been complaining about the coarseness of modern times and the kids these days for thousands of years. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, just, it's, like I said, there's, you know, the more, more things change, the more they stay the same, I guess. And that was kind of one of the, the ideas in this, putting all this together was that, you know, this stuff is familiar for a reason. Yeah. Have you written any other books? Yeah, um, so this, uh, I've got a few on Milwaukee. Um, I did pretty well at the paranormal conference, so I have a few left right now. <laughs> but um, so I did the, the, the Mayhem one and the, the New Hall House Fire book, which I unfortunately don't have any copies of right now. Uh, then my other big Milwaukee one was on the uh, Motion uh, motion Sensor Commission operated in Milwaukee from 1914 up until 1970. Which is something that a lot of people don't realize is that Milwaukee had one of the strictest motion sensor boards, uh, motion picture sensor boards in the country uh, in the 60s and 70s. So I've got those. I've got one coming out uh, hopefully in April. <coughs> um, it's the history of the Milwaukee Brewers told through their 52 home openers, which is, uh, I had a lot of fun doing that. Um, shifting from one kind of local disaster to <laughs> <laughs> But a bit of a change of pace for me since, you know, it's leaving behind or moving away from the, uh, you know, the more sensational. Um, but yeah, I've got, um, so I've got some of the, the uh, Mayhem books and the, some of the, the movie censor books. And then I also contributed a chapter in uh, 2018 to Milwaukee Noir, which is a collection of short fiction stories. Uh, What's your writing process like? Oh, um, what's ever asking? It's a bad, you know. I, I I do a lot of, you know. I've started a lot of books that I've never gone anywhere with. It's kind of hard sometimes to find. Uh, you know, to find a topic you're interested in, and then to, to make sure that that topic has legs, that it's going to you know, produce an entire book. Um, I had taken a while off from uh, doing books, uh, like the New Hall one came out in 2018, and um, I just, I actually did the, the opening day one, uh, it was a pretty quick process, I started that just last summer. Uh, so there was a few years where I wasn't really doing books because, um, you know, not to put too fine a point on thing, but these books don't make any money for me. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's a lot of research first. The first, you know, I think this, the, I don't even remember the Mayhem book, but the, the New Hall book took uh, about two years to do, and, you know, the majority of that is just research, just getting everything you can, taking Lots of notes, reading every newspaper, um, looking everywhere, and then you've got a stack of notes, and you try to make something of that. The actual writing, just for me, goes pretty quickly. Um, so it's you know it's a matter of of just getting into to doing it. You know, I've got a, a regular day job too as a librarian, so um, <laughs> it's a uh, you know I'm, I'm starting a new. Book project. I've got a new book project started now that I've you know, been away from for a couple weeks, so it's 
yeah, it's hard to, to work it into you know, your normal schedule. But once you really find, at least I find once I'm really into something and it, it's going well, that things tend to, to move pretty quickly. Do you do it longhand or do you bring a laptop oh, around? Oh, I can't. <laughs> um, yeah, just typing on uh, a laptop. Um, yeah, I was born in 1982, so I think I'm the last generation of people who know how to write cursive or <laughs> have any kind of handwriting ability at all. But uh, even mine is pretty, um, pretty sparse. So yeah, it's all it's all Word, <laughs> Microsoft Word. Does somebody from the public have any House, then do the editing, or how do you work that out? Yeah, so well, with uh, the Historical Society Press books, um, yeah, just to, to talk a little bit about the process of this, um, basically, you know, you get far enough along where you've got a couple of chapters and a broad outline for the rest, then you can send it to publishers, and um, you know, if they are interested, they'll talk to you more about it, they'll give you a contract, and then you've got you know, a year or however long to do the script deliver a manuscript, um, so then you rush to make that deadline and work 12 hour days and sweat and worry and then you give it to them and they put it in a pile with every other manuscript and like six months later somebody gets to it. Um, and then there's some back and forth with editing, um, you know, pick photos which is my least favorite part because uh, everybody wants a lot of money for photos. Yeah, and then the, the historical society books are a little different too, because it's a you know it's a state agency, so they got to put bids out for everything. So those take, you know, by the time it comes out, it's been a couple years since you did anything. Uh, that's not true of every publisher, but one you know, uh, working with the state. That's how that works. Good. You said you had another idea for another book. Yeah. Can you tell me what is it? Uh, what's another baseball idea? Okay. I'm not really too sharp on it yet, but it's... I don't want to tip my hand. We're very early on. But, uh, yeah, once, uh, once I'm to the point where I can actually start talking to publishers, then I start talking a little bit more about... Uh, I mean, it's not like a big secret. I don't think anybody's going to put me on, but it's just a process. Just curious about the <coughs> baseball bat. The Milwaukee Braves, when they came to Boston to one, that was like a phenomenon. Yeah. Did you ever look at it? I mean, that was just, you know, they were drawing a million people, and most people didn't know when they were going to the game. So it's not like today. Yeah. And it was kind of like, and then they went to the World Series by 57, I guess, and they haven't won Milwaukee to one yet. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a. Um, I wouldn't approach the the Milwaukee Braves stuff just because there's so many. Uh, there's a lot of good books on the team, um, and there's a, a lot of people who have that really really well covered. So I don't know if I'd have anything to to add to that. But yeah, just the. Um, I don't know, the baseball history in Milwaukee is always always interesting to me. Um, the the one I've got uh, coming out next year about the Brewers that's going to be. Uh, probably the most expansive, well, the most expansive history of the Brewers that's ever been uh, published. Because um, most of them have been like more hockey table type books, but this is an actual like, 450 page. Wow. Right now. <laughs> yep. You said you had a story in Milwaukee Noir. Is that the only fiction you've done? Um, not the only fiction I've written, the only fiction I'll ever allow anyone to read. <laughs> <laughs> I started out writing fiction, um, and I really have come to believe now that, like a lot of things, if you want to try to make it writing, you got to be bad at it before you kind of get to the point where you're not so bad at it, and then to the point where you can actually be kind of okay at it. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of, a few years trying to do that, and just terrible. Terrible stuff. <laughs> but it was fun to uh, try uh, nonfiction. I was a, a change of pace uh, for me, and I was glad that the uh, uh, Tim Hennessy thing had uh, put that together. I was glad to get the, the opportunity for him with uh, yeah, no fiction experience at all. That probably gets time for a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, you know, 
wasn't working. Can you hear me back there? No. All right. Um, one of the things I said I'd ask you a little bit about, and I forget my book is back there, is you talked about in the back of the, the book how at the age of 10 you lived in Manitowoc, correct? Mm -hmm. And became very interested. Wouldn't you say you were probably the only 10-year-old who was interested in moving to Milwaukee at the time? And I thought it was interesting. You also bring up the Dahmer case. Was that what was going on at the time? And yeah, I, I don't know. I was just... Um... Yeah, growing up in, in Manitowoc, it's funny now because the only reason anybody outside of the state has ever heard of it is because of a true crime documentary. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, my parents worked for the, or my dad delivered the Milwaukee Sentinel, so I was always, I read the paper a lot as a kid. Um, I just, I don't know, love the idea of a, you know, a big city with two newspapers. And, uh, a baseball team and serial killers. It's just like, it was so much to me. I like I'd always wanted to, to move down, uh, to move there. Um, so I did when I turned, uh, oh, I went down there for college and, and lived in the city for about 20 years. And, um, now well, my, wife, my wife and I bought a house in St. Francis. So it's, you know, three minutes away, but yeah, it's still kind of part of everything. And it was, yeah, it was just always, I don't know, I would, I would my only time I really came down here was to go to Brewer games with my dad. It was just, you know, seeing the old buildings and the graffiti and everything. It was uh, very, very interesting to me. And I, yeah, I'd always wanted to, to move down here just to, just to say that I, I lived here, I guess. But uh, yeah, and then I got into doing the, uh, the local history and it's, it's, it's a very, uh, it's got a very weird, interesting history. Uh, what a just odd, Quirks and stuff that I find very interesting. I did. Um, I led uh, boat tours on the Milwaukee River on the lake for. I did those for nine years. Um, got to see a lot of cool stuff, meet interesting people. So it's been, it's been a fun journey. Yeah. Well, if anybody would like to uh, buy the book, uh, I have a few copies for sale. Got a couple copies of Milwaukee Guar few copies of the movie censor book uh, if you're interested in anything else um, it's a library catalog it's probably in the library <laughs> um, otherwise yeah you can look for the the Brewers book it's gonna be called opening day in Milwaukee um, I I love my website and everything else laughs, but uh, yeah if you just keep your eyes open there'll be uh, events around the area um, Glad to talk to you about the rumors for a while. Great.